Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Conservation in the Classroom, where you get to interact with WWF's very own experts. My name is Kate. I will be the host of today's event. And before we get started, we like to always give a huge welcome and shout out to all of the classes that we have joining us live on camera today. We also have quite a few classes that are joining live off camera. So if you are one of them, please introduce yourself in the chat and we'll be sure to give you a shout out as well. So students, as you hear your school or your teacher introduce, that is your time to shine. Make sure to wave your hands, make some noise, let us know that you're there, okay? So let's start with Ms. Kudrick's class that's joining us from Matamoros, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, next up we have Ms. Joyner's class of second graders from Bogart, Georgia. <laughs> you guys know how to make some noise. I think you broke the volume there. All the way from Missouli, Montana, we have Janet and Patricia's Missouli International School. <laughs> You guys are really up in the ante on this volume competition here. Um, from Greenwood, South Carolina, we have Miss Glaw and the fourth graders at Springfield Elementary. <laughs> awesome, good to see you guys. And last but not least, from Pauley's Island, South Carolina, we have Miss Allen and Miss Smith's fourth graders from Waccamaw Intermediate. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. Um, we do have some classes, like I said, that are also joining us live off camera. So we'd like to give a quick shout out to them as well. So let's take a look here. We have Miss Watson's second grade class. We also have Montessori by the Sea, lower elementary students. We have Sullivan's Island elementary students. From South Amboy, New Jersey, we have the life skills class. We have the Highland School from Virginia, Dudson Elementary in Watertown, Connecticut. And let's see, we have from Fort Morgan in Colorado, we have another group joining us. So thank you everyone. We have a really fun topic to share with you today and an awesome presenter, which is of course the reason you guys are all here today is for Monica Echeverria. She is a deputy director here at WWF for Latin and um, Hispanic and Latin America engagement. So Monica frequently travels to Mexico um, between the United States and Mexico to help communicate the importance of protecting the habitats of monarch butterflies. And today she's gonna talk to us a bit about what makes monarch butterfly migration so special and what we can do to help them along the way. So without further ado, Monica, if you'd like to take it away, the floor is all yours. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Good. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Katie, and uh, hello everyone. I'm very excited to be here with you today, and especially to talk about one of the most fascinating species on Earth, which is the migration of the monarch butterfly. So I'm gonna share my screen with you, just a minute. Okay, I hope you can see the screen. Can you see that? Okay, now the screen is on, right? Okay, so before we start the presentation, let's talk about, I want to talk a, a little bit about myself. I was born in Mexico, I grew up in Mexico, I went to school there and studied social sciences. And then when I moved to the US, I continued my studies to study international affairs. And I started working in World War I found something like 19 or 20 years ago. Uh, part of my job, as Kitty was telling you, is to communicate about the conservation project we have in Latin America. And I have had a great opportunity to travel with reporters and with scientists to the forest in Mexico where the monarch butterflies 
spend the winter. So let me ask you, how many of you have ever seen a monarch butterfly? Hands up. I don't see any hands. Oh, yes, I see some hands. So I'm having some So the first time I saw a mono butterfly was actually in Mexico. And really, it's until you see them in person when you see how fascinated they are. But it's more exciting when you learn about the migration process. So today, I want to share with you the migration of the mono butterfly. We're going to also going to talk a little bit about the life cycle of the monarchs. And I'm going to explain why these guys are in danger. And of course, how can you help them? So this is a monarch butterfly. Uh, as you can see, they are very small. They weigh no more than one ounce. And yet, they can fly through all the US territory, half of the Mexican territory, before they reach the final destination, which is in the central of Mexico. And they, we're talking about a migration of close to 3,000 miles. So this is how it looks. As you can see, they are born in the north of the United States and the south of Canada. And these guys are going to cross all the territory, as you're going to see. Uh, and some people call them, at this special generation, like a super monarch butterfly, because they get to live many months, which I'm going to tell you later. And they are uh, able to travel like this. So at the end of the summer, they cross the US territory. They are right to Mexico around the beginning of November. They are going to spend the winter in Mexico. And then when the spring arrives, the weather it gets better, and they start to get ready to go back to the United States. Looking like this. So pay a lot of attention and look at this thing. OK. As you can see, there are new butterflies. The new generations are going to take over the migration. So this is the annual cycle of the super monarch butterfly. They are born in the United States, in the north of the country, in the south of Canada, and they're gonna be able to make this incredible journey. And nobody knows how they are allowed or they are able to get to the same mountains here in Mexico, in the central Mexico, where the great grand grand grandparents arrived the year before. So that's a mystery for science. So this is where they arrive. It's called the Mona Butterfly Biosphere Reserve. If any of you speak Spanish, you will see that it says Reserva de la Biosfera Mariposa Monarca. Of course, this sign is in Spanish because this is Mexico. This is a forest where they arrive every winter. So it's in Mexico, in the only place where they congregate by the millions, as I'm going to show you a little bit in this video. Sorry. And they look like this. So you arrive very early in the morning to the Mona Butterfly Biosphere Reserve. This is what you're going to see. All of them are congregated all together in branches. And the, the reason they do this is because they are uh, protecting themselves from the wind, from the cold, from the rain, which is very common at night in the forest. So they congregate at the end of the day, and they're going to sleep in these branches. And then when the sun starts to come out, this is what you start to see. They start to fly little by little as they get warm and they get comfortable. And they are going to look for flowers to take more sun. And they're going to start flying around, but they're never going to leave the reserve during the winter. Now, when they are in Mexico, they only hibernate, which means they're going to sleep, they're going to take the sun, 
and they're also gonna look for water. So I'm gonna show you a small video that I took like two weeks ago when I was there. Sorry. So this is how it looks more or less in February, okay? Now I'm gonna talk, I'm sorry about this guys. <laughs> I'm gonna change the subject. We're gonna talk about now the monographic life, life cycle. So how many of you have heard the word metamorphosis? Can you show me your hands? Okay, some of you have already, good. Well, metamorphosis means transformation and the butterfly goes through a very interesting transformation that you can see here. So first, as an adult, the butterflies are gonna put their eggs on this plant that is it's called the milkweed. And they put around 400 eggs sometimes, and it's gonna take four to eight days for this egg to mature. Then it's gonna become into a larva or caterpillar. The caterpillar or larva is gonna eat only the, the, um, the weeds uh, uh, of, the, of the milkweed. As you can see, it's gonna reach almost 3,000 times the original egg size. So as you can imagine how much they're eating when they are there. Uh, the last transformation process is becoming a pupa or a chrysalis, and it's gonna take them eight to 15 days to mature. And after that, a beautiful monobotify is gonna come out from the pupa. So what, that's what the transformation of the monobotify is. Here you can see a caterpillar. This is a real one, and it is on the milkweed. So, and Unfortunately, the monobotify migration is at risk because we humans are using a lot of herbicides in our gardens and also in agriculture uh, for the food that we produce. And that's killing a lot of the milkweeds and many other plants. So as the milkweed reduces, also the population of the monobotify is being reduced. So yes, they need your help. And how can you help the monobora flies in the United States? It's actually very easy. All you have to do is to plant native milkweeds during the spring and the summer. As I mentioned before, the milkweed is the only plant where the monobora fly is gonna put their eggs. So it's essential for their reproduction. Now, what is very important is that you find the right kind of milkweed, which is a native milkweed to your region. So whenever you go to a nursery, you can ask for native milkweeds, or you can ask your professor, your teacher to go to this website, to this page that is WLF2 Milkweed Finder, and you will see what kind of milkweed you have to get, depending on the region where you are. So I'm gonna show you that page from our website. So as you can see, there are several kinds of milkweeds and they are different by region. So hold on, I, don't, I think you cannot see the, the, the map. Hold on a minute. Yes, there we are. So there are different species of milkweed depending on where you live. So let's say for example, he is, who is here from New Jersey? Can I see some hands? I see some hands there. So let's see, New Jersey is in the Northwest, Midwest. In New Jersey area, you can find all these kind of native milkweeds that you can plant. So we're talking about five different species of milkweed. Now let's see who else is from Carolina, South Carolina, North Carolina. Can I see some hands? Yes, I see you guys. Okay, you are in the southeast. So let's check the region. You have all these species. In total, you have five different native species of milkweed that you can find and plant in your garden, in a school, or in a community center. Uh, let's see who else in the west region. Who is from Montana? I think somebody is from Montana, right? There is a school. Yeah, I can see you. Okay, so let's go to the west. There you have two species of milkweed, 
that you can find and plan to help the more arboreal plants. So now that you know how can you help the monarchs, we are really getting close to the end of my presentation. And before I say goodbye to you and thank you, I would like to show you a video that I took uh, last week as well, a couple of weeks ago, but for you want to uh, go do an overview. So we saw the migration of the Mona butterfly, we saw the life cycle of the Mona butterfly, and we also learned how can you help the monarch butterflies. So this is a small video, I hope you like it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so we can open the session for questions. If you have any questions, let us know. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Monica. That was a great presentation. We learned a lot about the migration of the monarchs. So we are going to get started on the question and answer portion of the event now. So classes, that now is your time to get together those questions that you want to ask Monica. Also, for those of you that are watching live off camera, if you have questions for Monica about monarchs, you can put them in the chat box and we will try to weave them in as we go through here. So let us start with Ms. Kudrick's class in Pennsylvania. If you guys are ready, you're up first. Make sure that you get right in front of the camera and talk nice and loudly for us. Do you know how many monarch butterflies hibernate every know. year? Well, that changes every year, actually, and we don't know how many exactly because, as you saw, it would be impossible to count one by one. So, what we actually measure is how many of them cover the forest in Mexico. And that's how we have learned that the population is declining. Okay, very good. Next up, we have Miss Joyner's class in Georgia. You guys are up next. Remember, nice and loud for Monica. Do you know if it could be a female or male? Well, that's a very interesting question. Yes, they are a little bit different. Males and females can be distinguished only by a little feature, uh, which, you, which are the dots. Let me see if I can share again the PowerPoint. So I can show you. So this is an individual butterfly here at the beginning of the presentation. Here we are. If you notice, this butterfly has two black dots in the wings. Well, that's a male. That's one way to know. Another way to know is that the veins are here. The black veins are very thin. In a female butterfly, these veins are going to be wider. So that's the only way you know. The size is very similar. So it's not a matter of size, but a matter of how the, the, way, the veins in the, in the wings are displayed. And if you have these two black dots, 
then you will notice that is definitely a male quarter of it. Okay, awesome. Uh, next up is the Missouli International School in Montana, if you guys are ready. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Can you repeat it again? <laughs> How do butterflies communicate? I'm sorry about that. Well, you know, that's very difficult to know. But just like oh, many other animals and other insects, they communicate to each other. Like, for example, we know that birds communicate because they fly and they do the same pattern. Well, we know that butterflies also communicate because they fly all together and they migrate all together. How do they do that? Well, that's something that we have to ask as a scientist. So I will get back to you on that one, okay? That was a very good question. Uh, next up is Miss Glaw's group from Springfield Elementary. Why do, why do monarchs only migrate to Mexico? Well, this special monarch butterfly only migrates to Mexico. You are right. Uh, and we don't know why. They selected the forest in central Mexico as the spot of the best spot to spend the winter. And as I mentioned before, one of the mysteries is that we don't know how the ones uh, that arrive every year don't know where the monarchs, where the forest is, and still they arrive to the same forest where the great grand grandparents arrived the year before. So that's a big mystery. Okay, and now Miss Allen and Miss Smith's group from Waccamaw Intermediate. What different types of animals have monarch butterflies? We're going to need you to be a lot louder. Can you speak up for us, please? Animals hide monarch, monarch, monarch butterflies. I'm sorry, can, sweetie, I can't hear you. Can you repeat it again? I'm sorry about that. What, what types of animals hunt monarch butterflies? What kind of animals? What's the question? What kind of animals? It, do you I think they're saying. I think they're saying hunt, Monica. Yes, hunt monarch butterflies. Is that the question? What kind of animals hunt monarch butterflies? Okay, actually they don't hunt. They don't hunt any other animal. They just feed from plants, from nectar plants. No, That's I think they, they want do. to know if any animals eat them. In any animals eat them? Well, very few animals are able to eat them. They have to be very clever because the reason they feed from milkweed is that that can help them to develop a kind of uh, substance that nobody else like. So it has to be a very clever animal that can only eat the body because the butterfly queens are full of this uh, kind of condiment that nobody likes, not other animal likes. So they have very few predators, which means very few other animals could hunt them. Okay, before we do another round of questions from the classes that are on camera, we're gonna take a question from the chat now. Um, we have a guest that wants to know how long do monarchs live and how long does the whole migration from Canada to Mexico take? Yes, the whole migration is, well, the migration starts at the end of the summer. They arrive to Mexico at the beginning of autumn. So that's already like two and a half months. They stay in Mexico from November to February of March, uh, depending on the weather, and they start leaving in early uh, March. So at the end of the day, it takes them um, eight months to do the whole cycle, like leaving from the North United States, arriving to Mexico, and going back again to the area in the United States where they're going to lay their eggs. So in total, we are talking about that the monarch butterfly that does this huge migration lives up to eight months. And then their babies, butterflies, uh, butterflies are going to live only three to five weeks, which is regular in other butterflies. 
and they're going to they're gonna continue the migration north. Okay, we are going to start back up with Ms. Kudrick's class for our second round of questions. So students, get your next question ready. So Ms. Kudrick's class, if you guys are ready, you're up next. Where were modern, modern, modern were butterflies mom? first discovered? Sorry? Oh. Where were monarch butterflies first discovered? Discovered? Yeah. Well, we knew about them from a long, long time ago, but scientists didn't know where do they go for migration, right? They knew they were living every year, they were living south, but it was until the late 70s, like 1976, that they were able to discover that they congregate in the forest of Mexico. And it was then later where the US scientists came to Mexico to prove they were the same monarch butterflies, which they did. So the monarch reserve was created in the early 2000s when they were sure that these butterflies arrived there every year. Okay, let's go to the Missouli International School so that they can get another question in here. Hi. <laughs> So when were when were monarch where like when, <coughs> when did they start exist exist existing? When did they start existing? Well, long, long, long time ago. We don't really know. Uh, we know they were discovered. The, the migration was discovered, as I was saying before, in the late in the middle of 1970, maybe 1975 or 1976. That's when we discover migration process, but they exist from a long, long time ago. Okay, next up, let's go to Miss Joyner's class. How do they pollinate? How do they pollinate? How do they pollinate? Well, uh, have you seen the bees? How do they pollinate? They go from floor to floor, but it's very, very similar. So monarchs need the nectar of the flowers to feed themselves during the migration. So when they fly from one plant, one flowering plant or one nectar plant to another, they are helping to pollinate. So that's why they are also very important because they are good pollinators. Okay, next we have Ms. Glaw's group at Springfield Elementary. Can monarchs be trained to fly different places. Can more, sorry, Siri, can you repeat? Can more ask what? Um, the question was, can monarch butterflies be trained to fly different places? No, that we know. And actually we don't want to try that because they are very uh, delicate individuals. And so as far as we know, we cannot be trained. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, they fly by themselves. They follow the nature. Okay, and Miss Allen and Miss Smith's group. How many monarch butterflies die through the migration? Well, it, differ. it depends on the year. Sometimes it's very cold. Sometimes they might find a hurricane during the migration. So we don't know exactly how many die during the migration, but we know that some of them die. What we know is that every year we are getting less and less monarchs arriving to the forest of Mexico. So that's why we need your help by planting milkweeds. Okay, going back to the chat here, Monica, we have a question um, from McDonald wants to know how much milkweed can a caterpillar eat in one day? Well, they don't move to another milkweed, but they can eat so much that they can grow up like 3,000 more the size of the original egg. So you can imagine that's a lot of milkweed. One other question that we had in the chat um, from Mr. Let me see. Um, 
sorry. Mr. Flom's class um, want to know how many eggs do monarch butterflies have at a time? Uh, they can lay eggs uh, up to 400. That's what the scientists found. That's a lot, right? Woo, that is a lot. Um, okay, we're going to go ahead and start our third round of questions. Um, so again, classes, if you're watching online, off camera, feel free to put them in the chat. We're going to start back up with those classes joining us on camera, back with Ms. Kudrick's class. Are you in there? Uh, Jason. Oh, where did monarch butterflies get their names from? Well, that's a very good question. And to be honest with you, I don't know. When they arrived to Mexico and they discover the migration and they were able to prove that they come all over from Canada and the United States, they don't really have the name. Uh, but I can get back to you on that, okay? Okay, moving on to Ms. Joyner's class. You ready? Why are monarch butterflies poisonous? Okay, do you remember I mentioned that they only eat from the milkweed? Well, that plant is one plant that has a little venomous. So when they eat them, they are eating venomous and that's why they have it. But they will have it only on their wings. Now that's not a potion for us humans, but it's potion for other animals, so, which is very clever. So they develop this capacity of having that venomous or poison in their wings, so no other animal can actually uh, attack them. Okay, good question. Next is the Missouli International School. <laughs> How much, how many years do monarch butterflies live? How many years? Not, not even one year. So the monarch butterfly that does a huge migration, the ones that goes from the United States to Mexico and goes back to the United States, gets to live eight months. That's the only butterfly in the world that lives so much. The usual, of the, uh, you know, usually all the butterflies live three to five weeks. Okay, very good. Next up is Ms. Glaw's group at Springfield Elementary. Oh, can't put it into the microphone. Okay, I would like to know from wild monarchs have to wait to lay their eggs in South Carolina or in the United States when they're already in Mexico. Sorry, can you repeat the question? How much what? Her question was, why do monarch butterflies have to wait mm -hmm. till they're in South Carolina to lay their eggs? Why don't they do it in Mexico when they're there in the winter? Oh, I see. Well, that's a very interesting question. And you know, that's part of the mystery of the monarchs they actually don't lay their eggs until they get to some parts of the United States, not only South Carolina, but also South Texas. And that's part, you know, that's part of the life cycle. And this is all, uh, this only happens with this butterfly that starts a trip, comes back, and uh, you know, that, that's, that's the way it is. Okay, and now Miss Allen and Miss Smith's group. We're going to need you to say that one more time. We didn't hear you. Why do monarch butterflies have that pattern on their wings? Did you hear the question, Katie? I, I yes, Monica. Yeah. She asked, why do monarch butterflies have that pattern on their wings? Oh, um, well, that's a, a very interesting question. I don't know. It's like, why do we have hair? We have eyes, right? That's, that's how they are. 
Okay, we're going to take another one or two from the chat here. So from Ms. Kramer's class, they want to know how can we help with conservation? Well, that's very important because as I mentioned before, uh, the mono population is declining. So if you can help us by planting milkweed, native milkweed from your region, wherever you are in the United States, you will be helping a lot. The monarch will fly to find milkweed and put their eggs when they are in the migratory route. Okay, and another question that got submitted in the chat, Monica, is from Montessori by the Sea Lower Elementary students. They want to know mm -hmm. how do you tell monarch butterflies from other similar butterflies? Well, I will look very careful to the pattern that I show you, to the monarch butterfly that I show you. It's not difficult because there are not too many like that one that is orange, black, and it has black and white. Uh, circles in the wings at the end of the wings. So just yeah, be careful. Try to find one on Google, on internet to compare. You find another similar one. Okay, I think we actually have time for one more round of questions, and this is probably going to be our last round. So make that last question a good one as we start back up with Miss Kudrick's class. Last one. Your boys. Um, Deborah. No, stand up. And take stand up. Stand up. Stand up. How, do you call Lisa? How does climate change affect um, on, Deborah. Um, monarch butterflies? Yes, climate change, unfortunately, is also affecting the monarch butterflies. Like it affects a lot of other species. As you might be aware, uh, there are a lot more hurricanes. They are stronger. And those winds are terrible for these little guys that are flying. So yes, climate change is affecting a lot. Um, there is not much we can do on climate change. But uh, again, you can do a lot by planting milkweeds. So you give them a little bit of a help, OK? OK, next up is Miss Joyner's class. What's your last question for Monica? Do monarch butterflies sleep? They do. They do, uh, especially when they are in Mexico and they arrive, they have to hibernate. So hibernation means that they sleep to recuperate and they do that during the winter. So they sleep all the night and until the sun arrives into the forest, uh, maybe at noon, they wake up, they start flying around, but they sleep a lot of hours so to recuperate from the long trip. Okay, we are going to jump to Ms. Glaw's group at Springfield Elementary. Does the size of the monarch butterflies' wings affect how they fly? Um, not the size. No, they can fly, but they're usually the same size. They're, they don't they're not too different. They're, it's not like a small and a big one. They are very much the same size. As long as their wings are not, you know, broken, they can fly very well. Okay, and our last group that we have still on camera with us is Miss Allen and Miss Smith's group um, from Waccamaw Intermediate. Your last question for Monica. How fast can a monarch butterfly fly? Sorry, so can you repeat the question? A monarch butterfly fly. How, she fast? Asked how fast can they fly? How fast can they fly? Hmm. Um, if I, no, I really don't remember. I, of course, they don't fly too fast because they're very small. Uh, but I, I can't get back to you on that one with your teacher because I don't remember exactly how fast they go. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank everyone that joined us today, both on camera and off. If you still have questions for Monica on monarch butterflies that did not get answered, feel free to email them to wildclassroom at wwfus.org, and we will be sure to pass those along to her so that she can follow up with you. Also, teachers, if you're looking for additional monarch related um, educational resources, be sure to check out the monarch toolkit available on Wild Classroom. And this presentation will be available as soon as we 
end here, you can find it on the conservation in the classroom website within Wild Classroom as well. So what we're going to do now is unmute everyone's microphone so everyone can give a big thank you to Monica. So thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone.